shake the word of God, please, and turn with me to the 56th Psalm. The 56th Psalm. <clears throat> we see this Psalm of David when he was captured by the Philistines and they took him to Gath. See that uh, David was fearful for his life during this instance in 1 Samuel 21. And he is so fearful that he pretends himself to be crazy. <laughs> and it says that spittle is running down his beard. He finds himself in a place of fear of what they're going to do to him and the harm that they could bestow to him. But yet even in this fear, even in a, an unsure time, even when things seem dire straits, look what David writes and the confidence that he has. He says in the fourth and fifth verse, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Rising above fear. We all have fears. You and I, you've had fears. I have fears. I still have fears. And some fears uh, you get over or, or overcome or don't bother you as much. And some fears you may never get over, I, I guess, this side of heaven. There have been many people who have been crippled by fear. Some people have phobias. I have uh, what's called claustrophobia. It's not as bad as when I was a kid, um, but it's pretty bad. Uh, I don't like to be in confined spaces. It's interesting, a phobia is considered, by definition, a ridiculous fear, meaning that the fear uh, or the, uh, um, the fear you have is not rationalized by the danger in which the fear is present. Uh, I'm feared of, of, of being in a box, but there's sufficient air, uh, there's a way of escape, but being in the box makes you fearful. Uh, there are some people that have a fear of heights. They have a fear of getting on ladders, or even one step off of the ground cripples them. Uh, there are people that are afraid of, of spiders. Those people are called normal. Um, I'm just kidding. But I don't, I don't really fear spiders too much. Uh, they are small, and they can get into places. That's, I think, why they bother me so much. Uh, if you ever see me when I work under my house, I always have a full suit on, taped up everywhere. Ain't no spider getting here. I can play with snakes all day long, but you got a spider, I'm out. That's not cool, you know? Uh, I'm that guy that runs into the web in the park, and I look absolutely insane, fearing for my life, you know? Some things about shadow boxing. But some people, their fear cripples them. You're seeing that, honestly, in our world right now, what fear can do. A good friend of mine, Eric Hastings, a pastor in Virginia, he uh, said something the other day that was so profound to me. He said, you know, something I've struggled with, I went through Bible college, I've studied my Bible, I've studied end times, and something that has always bothered me is I thought to myself, how is it the Antichrist is going to trick everybody, and how is it that people are going to willingly take the mark of the beast? And he goes, then I looked at the news today and thought to myself, it's going to be a lot easier than what we think. You see people today, they're lining up, and, and the mass hysteria, we joke about the toilet paper, but really, uh, people post a video about the potential of things running out and what happens, those things are running out. Not even that that's a crisis that you need it, but people are so afraid of what could happen, they make things worse. We're driving ourselves together. We're worried we want to be separated to keep away from the coronavirus and things affecting our life, but yet we go by the thousands to the store to load up on things, and we, get in, we don't want to spread our, 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 our fluids to other people, but we'll punch each other in the face for some toilet paper. We went to Myers the other day, and we went there because we legitimately just needed some things. And I walked in and literally laughed out loud at these hundreds of people in line. It took us 30 to 40 minutes to cash out with 18 lines open. We were in, I was hanging out in the women's section. I thought, well, this is normal anyway because I'm always with my daughters. But I'm just hanging out, chilling, waiting to get up there in the line. And people are looking for their moment to get in. They're living in fear. There was a man for 32 years, lived in hiding. He was part of, of the neo-Nazi wartime activity, and he was fearful that he was going to be punished for things that he had done. So instead of coming forward, he lived at his sister's house for 32 years, never walking outside, never doing anything, until one day his sister had to buy extra bread for something, and people found that he was there. And this is what he said. He said, if I had not been discovered... I would have remained in hiding. He says, so I am happy that this happened. Russ told a reporter throughout those years, he did nothing. He never left his house, and he could only look down on the village. 
fear is living in a prison. The Bible says that God has not given us that spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. You and I have something living inside of us that should not be controlled, as we've said before, by our circumstances, though you and I will have fear. And there is a proper fear to have, which we'll talk about in a moment. But it's interesting because the fears you and I have now are different than the fears you and I had when we were little. But you know the interesting thing is your children have different fears than what you had when they were their age. According to John Hopkins' research, they reported 30 years ago the greatest fears of grade school children were number one, animals, number two, being in the dark, in dark room, number three, high places, number four, strangers, and number five, loud noises. Those sound pretty legitimate? All you adults are those things you would say that were common fears? 30 years later, are you ready for what the kids are afraid of now? Number one, divorce. Number two, nuclear war. Number three, cancer. Number four, pollution. And number five, being mugged. Those are the top five fears of our children today compared to 30 years ago. It's interesting, the things we talk about, the things we promote in our own home, the things that we allow ourselves to be fearful of. And it's reflected in what our children are afraid of now. Before, it was things like being in the dark, animals that could physically harm you, high places that could harm you, strangers that could take you, and loud noises. But now, one of the number one fears our kids have is, will my mom and dad stay together? Will we be attacked by some foreign country? Will I get a disease? Will my mom and dad get a disease? See, I believe that our children, their fears have changed because the fears that we have, we've allowed it to control, dictate, and direct our own lives. Sometimes unbeknownst to us. So I'd say for Christians, it's time that we rise above fear. When I think of David and what he was going through, dealing with his life being on the line, but yet still having the confidence to string his harp and play. Still having the confidence. And the first thing I want to show you tonight is what David, how he starts it off in verse number four. He says, what time I am afraid. What time I am afraid. So the first thing I want you to notice is realize you will be afraid. You will have certain fears in your life. But it's how you deal with them is what makes the difference. I am afraid of certain things. Uh, in, in leadership as a pastor, do you know, one of the fear, greatest fears I think that I have is that even after I pray about something and make a decision, I want to make sure it's the right decision. Not because of necessarily what happens, more so that I'll stand before God for that decision. That's a, that's a big deal. As a parent, a great fear is what I'm doing around my children and promoting around my children. Because, again, most importantly, I'm going to stand before God for those things. I fear, even when I get on a motorcycle, I fear for what could happen. I still like to ride motorcycles, but I like to be cautious and be fearful, have a respectful fear of it. But David says, when I am afraid, and let me tell you, there are going to be fearful instances you get into. You go out and witness to somebody. Sometimes it can be fearful. But your fear should not cripple you from being obedient. Your fear should not cripple you from praising the Lord. He says, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In other words, he knew that fear was a part of his life and fear was something that could limit him. Fear is one of the greatest limitations for us achieving what God has for us in our life. It really is. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what could happen. Fear of what people will think. Perhaps the biggest barrier against one's progress in life is that of fear. Probably the highest hurdle that an individual may have to scale in order to leap to achievement is that of fear. Uh, especially in some of the young people today. They're afraid of trying things because they're afraid of failure. 
my thought is that I'm going to do my best and forget the rest. Do what I can do, do what I know to do, and am I going to fail? Yes, I'm going to fail sometimes. But I know if I fail, then I can look to the Lord and he'll give me the strength to get back where I need to be. I don't want my fear to cripple where I'm at. I can look at a life of David and say, boy, a man that could admittedly say, I'm afraid of some things. And there's been fear in my life, whether it's, a, whether it's because of instances he has allowed into his life or the position he had for leadership created uh, a place of fear. He still says, I will be afraid. But in that fear, in that vulnerability, in that time where I feel out of control, God, I'm going to trust you because I know you're in control. So what is fear? By definition, fear is an emotion induced by a perceived threat that can cause animals or humans to move quickly away from the location of perceived threat. Fear is a condition of being afraid. Scientifically, fear is a basic survival mechanism that occurs as a response stimulus such as pain, threat, or danger, which leads to the fight or flight instinct. Fear is a distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, evil, pain, whether the threat is real or imagined. Have you ever been afraid of something and you found out later on that it was totally manufactured in your own mind? You had a fear and you made it way worse than what it really was going to be? I've had people, uh, you know, this is, a, it may seem like a, a funny illustration, but it really is true. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Adam tried something brand new food-wise. And he goes, I've been missing out on this all my life because he was afraid to try it. He's afraid to try a new food. He's a, he's a finicky eater. He's like Morris the Pussycat. He won't eat nothing but nine lives. That's right. You don't feed him for about two weeks, he'll eat, he'll eat anything, you know. He'll eat, he'll, he likes fish, which is kind of odd. Not that he likes fish, but if you're picky, usually fish is like the first thing to go, you know. Olivia loves fish. Um, but it's fear of something that may be even rational or irrational. Fear, now listen, fear is from the devil, is one of his greatest weapons. Now, don't get me wrong, we are to have a reverential fear of God. But God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of sound mind. Fear is more than a feeling, it is a spirit and can be manifested in other complications and ailments like phobias, confusion, panic attacks, and depression. So what are some dangers of fear? Fear brings limitations, stagnation to our lives. You think of John 10.10 10, where it says, For the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. If you know you have an adversary that is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, that can induce fear. But that's only if you stop at that portion of the verse. He says, But I am come that you might have life and that you ha might have it more abundantly. There's a danger of fear by being limited by what God can do, by only looking at the danger, by only looking at the enemy. When God says, listen, I have defeated that enemy already. And we don't live under that power. We live in the power of abundance that God gives to us. Fear can destroy our relationships with suspicion and keep us from having good friendships. Do you know that? Fear can make you say yes when you want to say no. Fear can make you say no when you want to say yes. These are some great dangers. One of the greatest, one of the greatest dangers for fear, and you see this very commonly, especially amongst Christians, is fear isolates people. We know that the Bible says that our adversary as the devil walketh out as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If we allow our fear of not fitting in or what people think of us or, or th something we have done or not being able, or, or honestly, in good Christian circles, this is probably the greatest fear that I cannot come to you and get right with you on a problem because I'm afraid of what could happen. Let me tell you something. You're isolating yourself, and the danger is far greater than the fear that you're avoiding. The lion never comes for the healthy gazelle or the group. He comes for the weak and the wounded, the small and the sick. The easy pick. The devil is no different. There is an isolation. We ought not to be like that. Proverbs 18 and verse 24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. 
We often tell that to people. There's, I don't have any friends. So I say, are you making yourself friendly? Are you isolating yourself because you have nothing in common? Find something in common with people. Listen, I'm an odd duck, and I still find things in common with people because I want to. If you want friends, go make friends. You say, well, I don't like the things they do. Well, maybe learn to like them. I didn't like sushi when I started hanging out with Austin and Aaron and things like that. But you know what? I learned to like it because they like it. And I knew it wasn't going to kill me. I didn't have any fish allergies. And if I did, I was just going to get to heaven that sooner. <laughs> but it was worth it. Why? Because it's something they like. You know, the funny thing is, I don't think we, no, one time, one time we've eaten sushi together. One time. But it was worth it to me. Learned some things. Now, I stopped at like manga and, you know, you know anime. I'm not into that. But there are certain things you can learn. Why? Because I want to show myself friendly. I don't want to be isolated by the fear of not being accepted or whatever the case may be. So he says, I want to know the first thing to rise above fear is acknowledge that you are going to have times of fear. You're going to have times of struggle. But it's what you do with it. David says, in my fear, in my time of fear, I'm going to trust God. So let's look at a couple more things. The second thing, in times of fear, he says to praise his word. Praise his word. In verse 4, it says, In God I will praise his word. If you are fearful, as a Christian, if you are feel for fearful, the only thing for sure that is going to bring you comfort is the word of God. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Something you can go to that's consistent and stays the same and something you can have confidence. If you're in a bad mood, God's word is the same. If you're happy, God's word is the same. If you're sad, God's word is the same. If you're broke, God's word is the same. If you, if you are destitute, God's word is the same. If you are dying, God's word is the same. It's the promises that you can turn to. And so in times of fear, praise his word as being consistent and everlasting. There's no greater comfort giver than the Lord himself, isn't there? May we find comfort in his promises in his word. A couple things, com some things of comfort I want to give to you tonight. First thing, the spirit of God gave us does not make us timid. The spirit that indwells in you is not a spirit of timidity, all right? The Bible says, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the spirit. The picture he's giving there is a person that is filled with the spirit will do things more boldly, go places they may never ever have gone, say things they may have never ever said. So the spirit that indwells in you and I is not that of being timid. He says, as we've quoted several times, 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is the spirit which God has given us. So in times of praise, of times of fear, praise his word. And his word says the spirit that indwells every believer is not that of fear. Trust in his word. He also says be strong and courageous. We see, uh, uh, we see here in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy, turn with me please. Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 through 8. We see Moses is now transferring uh, things over to Joshua. Uh, he is now 120 years old. He's served for, with them for 40 years in that sense, but he's not allowed to go into the promised land. And now the reins are being torn, turned over to Joshua. And so he's giving him the confidence. He's given him word that not to fear of these things and the people not to fear of it because at the end of the day, it may be a change of leadership, but God is in control. Moses wasn't doing the work. God was doing the work through Moses. Joshua, he says, as the Lord was with Moses, he'll be with him. And so obviously there's a little bit of fear that what's going to ha happen here. And starting in verse 6, it says, Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage. For thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sw uh, sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. I want to tell you something, that in times of fear, we can lean upon God's word. And God's saying, hey, there could be a change of leadership. There could be things changing, things moving around. But don't be afraid because I'm leading, I'm guiding. I am with you. You know when you should be afraid? When you feel as if God is not with you. That's when you should be afraid. 
You shouldn't be afraid when your circumstances and things like that change because God is still in control. God's still in control. Joshua was somebody that was a proved leader. He led the Jewish army to beat the Amalekites. He was the one of the 12 spies uh, that came back, and him and Caleb sided with Moses. He was a faithful man. But yet there was still that transition where people said, hey, uh, God had to give them the confidence and comfort to say, listen, I'm still in control. You know, where basically what he's trying to give to them is that God knows what he's doing. He also tells us another thing is to fear no evil. The famous shepherd psalm, Psalm 23, and verse number four says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Not because I'm a hardcore Christian, not because I'm just really awesome, but he says, the colon right after that says, For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, are they, the, thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. In other words, God's word is trying to remind us that he is our protector. When you feel alone, when you go through the valley, did you hear me? When you go through the valley, know that God is with you. When you have to deal with it, know God is with you and fear no evil. Another thing is God gives us comfort in basically saying, why would we want to waste our time worrying? You're only allotted a little bit of time, and you're going to give it account for how you steward that time. So why waste it worrying? Luke 12 and 25 says, And which of you, with talk, uh, taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? You know, we worry about the most silly things in, our, in the world. When I was in high school, I thought about the same thing. If I could just get a little bit taller, if I just could make it to six foot, that would be great. Some of you guys, I'm not mentioning any names, Clayton, was saying to himself, if I could just grow a beard, that would be great. He's working on it, you see? It's all, hey, listen, it only took him eight weeks. He's there. That's good. Two weeks. Oh, two weeks. Okay. But no, we, we said to ourselves, if we think hard enough, maybe these things will happen. We ought not to worry about things we ought not to be able to control. Matthew, uh, matter of fact, Matthew chapter 6, he talks about taking no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take care of itself. We live in fear, uh, especially with this instance going on. Obviously, there are fears. What am I going to do if they close the restaurants and I have restaurant work? Where am I going to get a paycheck from? And, and when the restaurants close down, Brother Aaron and I were talking about how they're limited on some of the stuff they can get. And Whirlpool's having problems of getting their stuff in. And it would be easy to say, what am I going to do? And, and even people that work at Chef Garden, they have restaurants that they work for. And will it so you, you have these things you have to think about. And you have one of two choices. You can be consumed about what could happen. Or you can be confident about what you know to be true and that God is in full control. I get it. When you're here, it's difficult sometimes to see that. It's difficult. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But you have to bring yourself to the place where you're humbled before God. Because in your fear, you can't just pick yourself up by your bootstraps and get out of it. You need to run to the word of God. And say, I'm going to praise thy word. I'm going to praise the thing that does not change in an ever-shifting and changing world. I'm going to get my confidence there. There's no sense in worrying. I want you to know when we go to God's word, I love this setting of scripture. And Paul said in Romans chapter 8, go with me to Romans chapter 8. And one thing we can praise God's word for is you and I, I hope this is our testimony, that like Paul said, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Paul talks about being persuaded. And I tell you what, when I got saved and born again and began to walk as a Christian and really got sold out for God, I was persuaded in my mind that God was true and I was going to live for him. I may not always do what's right sometimes. <laughs> I might make the best decisions sometimes. But I am persuaded in my mind that I am going to serve God. And this is the great truth we have. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you glad to be fully persuaded that God is in control and that nothing can separate you from that love of God? Nothing. Then a question you have to ask yourself is, if I look to God's word, another question you ask yourself is, who shall I fear? 
Psalm 27 and verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In other words, as the New Testament says, If God be for us, who be against us? Who do you really have a genuine fear against if you have almighty God on your side? Whom shall I fear? To rise above fear, knowing that I have God in my corner, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good advantage I'd say I'd have. I want to show you a third thing. Not only do we praise his word, but in times of fear, we place trust in him. We place trust in him. David was afraid in his situation, but he still was not too afraid to praise the Lord and to trust him. He knew God was with him during this time. And I want you to tell you that God gives us throughout his word that he is with us and we can trust him. It is a shame sometimes that during times of trouble, troubles, we look to ourselves, our own ability. And listen, I'm, I'm just as guilty. When times get tough, I say, what can I do to fix this? How can I do this? I don't have money, so can I work more? Or I don't have this, or somebody's health is bad, let's do this. When our first reaction, my first reaction, should be to fall on the face of God, who is in full control, and say, God, I trust you. Please lead me that when I make these decisions, it's I take myself out of the situation. I love that statement. I just heard a couple weeks ago, and I, I think that's great. Take myself out of the situation. God, lead and guide and direct me. In times of fear, place trust in him. Isaiah 41, verse 10, I want you to see this. Isaiah 41, and verse number 10. A famous setting of scripture, but I want you to see this. And we're going to talk about what happens when you trust God. Isaiah 41 and 10, verse 10, says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41.10. Aren't you glad that God says, don't fear, don't be afraid. You know, it's not the first time he told Abraham not to fear. He talked to Isaac and gave him some confidence in his time of fear. And there are many prophets that had fear of what they were doing. God told the children of Israel not to fear. Just trust him. When you trust God, a couple things happen. First of all, you pray. When you trust God, you pray. Why? If you trust him, you, want, you need to communicate with him. You need to make sure those lines of communication are, are wide open. When you trust somebody, you can talk to them about anything. You can talk to them anytime. You can share with them the deepest, darkest parts of your heart. And what a great feeling it is to know that you have somebody that you can share that with. I hope and trust that you, uh, not only uh, do you have somebody here on earth, but I hope that's how you trust God, that you can come to him and you pray. There's no room when we're trusting God for miscommunication. You get a peace. God wants us to find peace even in times of fear and trouble. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We get peace. Not only that, when we trust him, we have hope. We have hope. God gives us a hope. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 25. Think about this scene, all right? You have Paul and Silas. They're in this prison. They've lo they're locked up for giving the gospel. And this is not the place that you would think in Acts chapter 16 that you'd have your very own singspiration. But when your trust is in God, you have hope. And it says there in Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. They had hope of who they were serving. But not only that, the interesting thing is, when those prisoners heard them, what do you think they gave to the other prisoners? A little bit of hope. A little bit of hope. Another thing what happens when you, sell it, when you uh, trust in God, you can celebrate God's blessings. When you trust God 
and you see him begin to provide and begin to move in your life, you get to celebrate the blessings you see literally right in front of you. Boy, I'm glad I trusted God for this in my life because I got to see him work. I'm glad I trusted God when I talked to my friend because he allowed me to lead them to the Lord. I'm glad I trusted the Lord and, and came to this church because uh, my family and my life has been blessed. I'm glad I trust the Lord because I've seen him move. When you trust God, you can celebrate God's blessings. When we put our trust in God, his blessings become more apparent. Not only that, but when we trust God, we find courage. I've told this story several times, and many of you know it, but there is a song that was written by Bill and Gloria Gaither called Because He Lives. It was written during a time of depression, and they were finding out they were having another child. And a matter of fact, you see that in the, in the words of the song. It says, how sweet to hold a, a newborn babe. It talks about he can face uncertain days because he lives. And they were living in a time where the finances weren't good, and they got to share the news. Now, now Dylan and Taylor, aren't you glad that when you share the news about your child, people were happy for you and excited and could you imagine when you told them about that, they instantly said to you, are you kidding me? You're a Bible college student living on Raymond noodles and Franks and beans. What are you doing having a child? And when there's coronavirus, you're bringing them in this sin-sick world? Would that take a little bit of the excitement off? I think it would be a little more discouraging. Probably more so for your wife than for you. But that's not what you want. And that's what Miss Gloria came with. She was sharing the news of their new child on the way, and during this time of depression, people were saying, are you kidding me? Why would you bring a child in this world? In such uncertain times, your child's going to have nothing. It's going to starve. How are you guys going to have money to live? And listen, they were Christians at the time. <laughs> Aren't these supposed to be the most encouraging people in your life? He says, as they were dealing with these things, they said, we just had to fall on our face and trust God. And when they began to trust God, God gave them the words of that song, because he lives. And they could still say, how sweet to hold a newborn babe that can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all hope, all fear is gone. What a powerful song. What a powerful truth. You'll find courage. I want you to write this down. Sometimes the Lord calms a storm, but sometimes he lets a storm rage and calms his child. Sometimes God will calm the storm, but sometimes God will allow the storm to rage and he'll calm the child in the storm. God may not fix your circumstances. He may need you to go through it to strengthen you for something else. I have learned as I grow in my own Christian life to thank and praise God for the trials. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. For my, your faith is working in patience. And last, I want to show in times of fear, only fear God. In times of fear, only fear God. Don't fear your circumstance. Don't fear the coronavirus. Don't fear your bills. Don't fear your bill collectors. Fear God. Fear God. We give too much fear to the temporal things. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. There was a gentleman that carried a quote by George Mueller in his wallet until it basically dissolved to nothing. And this is what the quote said. It says, there was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller. His opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. Died to the world, its approval or censure. Died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have only to show myself approved of God. If the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, then the fear of man is the beginning of misery, compromise, and disappointment. We should only fear God. Only fear God. Dying to self and our own self-will and our own self-promotion and our own desires and fear God. For there we find true wisdom. It will not last as a Christian. You will not be truly happy unless you find yourself to be dead to the approval of this world 
and live to show, show yourself approved only to God. As we close out, we think of this thought of rising above fear. To me, it's about perspective. Where's your focus? Is your focus on the things of this world, the things that could happen? Because lots of things could happen. You could get in a car wreck, but you're still going to drive home. You could choke on your next meal, but you're still going to eat. You could drown, but many of you are still going to swim or take a bath or even take a shower. Listen, my shower is like a ski slope, and I feel like I'm going to die every time I get in this thing. There's been more than one time I've heard a, don't come in, but I did fall. <laughs> Listen, at my house, if you ever stay there and have to take a shower at my house, you better make sure you're saved because you could die in the tub, okay? But I don't fear those things. I don't fear those things. Listen, I'm not going to jump off a bridge and go, I trust you, Jesus, because I'm going to die. But I'm not going to fear coronavirus. I'm not going to fear if people like me or not like me. I'm not going to fear to make the decisions you have to make sometimes because I have to fear God more. Am I standing before him? He gives us our great confidence. He gives us our great hope. And in times of fear, we need to praise his word. We need to trust him and we need to only fear God because you will have fears. There's going to be unassuredities. Listen, Dylan, when you have that baby, there's going to be fears. As a, as a father, watch your kids get hurt. Things they do, they're going to break your heart sometimes. There's going to be fears in, in ministries when we're moving forward. Times we may take a step back. But we cannot stop that, allow it to stop us from serving the Lord. And we can't be crippled by that fear. Really, God has shown us and promised us that we must, as Christians, rise above that fear. And David, what a great example. His life was in fear. But he said, listen, when I, what time I'm afraid? I will trust in thee. And tonight, I, I, I trust that you're trusting in the Lord. And when you're afraid, and when you have struggles, and when you have trials, run to the Lord first and foremost. Let's pray together, shall we?